If you open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, we're looking at chapter 5. Looking at verses 1 through 5. And they're trying to clear up some confusion on Scripture about the difference between the rapture and the day of the Lord. There is enormous confusion over this in Christianity and has been since Paul introduced the idea of the mystery of the rapture. Uh, the whole church age dispensation is part of a mystery uh, doctrine. And you really have to understand that. And the rapture is part of the mystery doctrine of the church. But the day of the Lord is no mystery. The day of the Lord is no mystery. It was taught clearly in the Old Testament. The second coming of Christ, now they didn't call it the second coming, but the coming of the Lord, both in what we now call the first advent and the second advent, was clearly taught in the Old Testament. But there was, what wasn't taught was first and second advent. It was just the advent of Christ. Christ would come into the world. What separates the first coming from the second coming of Christ is the presence of the church in the world. It was the mystery doctrine. So when you read the Old Testament, when, when you read the Old Testament, it, the Lord will come. It's called the day of the Lord. And terrible things will happen when he comes. Now, in the Old Testament, they, there was a, a first, there was just the advent. Okay? So you really have to get that clear in your mind. Um, when you study the New Testament, because they're going to mix these ideas up a little bit. And so you really have to pay attention when you're reading that, how to distinguish that. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5, there's a lot of confusion about this because of the mixing up of some words. And young believers who are not getting a proper diet of good, solid teaching get confused about that. Get confused about it. And the, and the Thessalonians had some problems because Paul, he introduced them to the idea of the second coming of Christ, having brought them into the first coming through salvation. He's now trying to orient them to the second coming of Christ. And there, there is some confusion to them about it, about the day of the Lord, just what is the day of the Lord, and what is this idea of the, of the church being caught up we call it rapture, harpazo, being caught up to be with the Lord and the day of the Lord. Well, is that all one? Well, it is in a way and not in another. Paul introduced a theological term, which we discussed last time, parousia, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -S we talked about that Greek structure of that word, when it says the coming of the Lord, that's the word parousia that's almost always used for that. Not, not necessarily always, but that's, that's a theological term to uh, describe the greater event of the second coming of Christ. The whole event. When you use parousia, you're looking at the whole event of the second coming of Christ. The first event that's going to occur of several, the first is going to be the rapture of the church, then the tribulation, then the day of the Lord. When he comes at the, at the tribulation, at the end of the tribulations, and it will be a day of, of, of destruction. And, uh, then you're going, we'll, then, and then we'll have the millennial age, and then another warfare. So there, there is... So Paul is trying to clear up some of that discussion. Let, let, me, let me show you how confusing it was. Let, let me just show you a moment, then we're going to have a word of prayer. Go with me to Acts 1. Let me show you how confusing uh, people were because they hadn't been properly taught on the mystery doctrine. If you're not properly talk, uh, taught on the mystery doctrine of the church by, by, by Paul, 
then you'll surely misunderstand what he says most of the time. Here we are in the first chapter. Look at verse, now this is, Jesus has died on the cross, he's been buried, he's been raised from the dead, and he's been in post-resurrection appearances with his disciples for 40 days. And he's about to ascend back to heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father in verses 9, 10, and 11. Now, I'm in verse 6. Now, in verse 4, he gathers them together and commands them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for, the, wait for what the Father had promised. And then in verse 5, he explains the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As soon as Jesus gets back to heaven, he's going to baptize them at Pentecost with the Holy Spirit. The church age is going to begin, and it's going to be a whole mystery doctrine of the church age. Now in verse 6, you can see some of their, they're having trouble with this idea because there hasn't been an explanation of the mystery of the church in the earth, on the earth. So he says, so when they had come together in verse 6, they were asking him saying, Lord, is it at this time you were restoring the kingdom to Israel? See, they're thinking millennium And we and we and what we're having experientially is the mystery of the church, and the mystery of the church is not going to come till Acts two, and then the rest of the New Testament is all about this mystery and the dynamics of it on the earth. He said to them, "Now watch what he says." He said to them, "It is not for you to know the times." Or the epis. Now look over to look, look just for a moment. Look over to uh, our passage in First Thessalonians five. Look at five. Where he look at verse one. Now as to the times and the epics. You see that? See, they were asking that in Acts. They want to know, all right, you've come. Now it must be time to restore the millennial age. Right? Christ has got to come. There's got to be a tribulation because there's seven years of Daniel, ninth chapter, unfulfilled yet. And then the millennium. So they're figuring, that, well, Christ has come. And so the next thing on the, on the docket must be the millennial age. Well, the next on the docket, Bubba, is the tribulation, according to Daniel. But they, they skip over that and go right to the millennium. Because they're thinking in terms of times and epics. In other words, they're, they're looking at the coming of Christ as one event, the coming of Christ that has specific events in time, times and epics. What they don't understand now and will once Pentecost occurs and the Holy Spirit begins to teach them, they'll discover that what sets between the first coming and the second coming of Christ is the mystery doctrines of the church age or dispensation. So here's what he says. It's not for you to know the time of the effort for what the Father has fixed by his own authority, but here's what's coming next. See, they, they want to know the time of the epics. Oh, he says, okay, I'm going to leave, going back to the Father, and here's what's next on the docket. Here's what's next on the list. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And after that, 
he bid farewell, and away he went. Now, we got people still asking the same question. And listen, it, it's normal for young believers who are just being introduced to the Word of God in the church age to have these kind of questions. Well, how does this fit? How does the New Testament fit with the Old Testament prophecies about Christ? How does that fit? Those are legitimate questions for immature believers who are growing in their faith in the Word of God. These are legitimate questions, and they deserve answers, and we'll give them today as we go through the book of 1 Thessalonians. You remember that every chapter in the book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul gives a principle on the second coming of Christ. Every chapter ends in his book to answer that question. Every chapter. Now, the long chapter on it we studied last week, which is called the rapture, the harpazo of the parousia of the bigger picture. This is where it begins. And so they're asking these questions. They're fine. They're legitimate. You probably have a lot of questions about eschatology. How does, how does what we're taught in the New Testament fit with the Old Testament on what we call now the second coming of Christ? Isn't it interesting that the second coming of Christ has become a normal, stable a doctrine in the church. It wasn't in the early church. I mean, they were learning that there was a whole mystery dispensation of time called the church age. And, and, the, and the Jews especially really struggled with that. And, uh, and the key doctrine for them was the resurrection of Christ. Isn't that interesting? And boy, Paul pounded it all the time. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get in this morning's study uh, to try to understand what they're asking and what, how Paul is answering this question. Because he just covered, remember now, Ephesians 4, uh, at the la last, you know, 13 through 18, he just covered the rapture of the church, I mean, right down to detail, right? In fact, it's one of the clearest teachings on the rapture of the church. The other, the other teaching on it is 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. Well, you should know this stuff. The, the majority of Christian people out there in the churches who are not properly fed the word of God just struggle with these kind of things. What does this mean? How, does this, uh, how is the rapture different than the day of the Lord and all this kind of stuff? Well, you've got to just keep it all in context. But the biggest thing, you have to study the mystery of the church to ever put this together. There's no way you can put it together without it. And the whole New Testament is about the doc The whole New Testament is all about the doctrines of the mystery of the church. You know, once you, once you move away from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, once you get there all the way to through through the opening of the book of Revelation is all about the mystery of the church. You know, after you leave, after you leave uh, chapter 5 in Revelation, you know, you're in the tribulation and then the end of time. So it's just interesting. And, and uh, we be in a teaching church. We want to be sure that you have all your ducks in a row on this subject matter. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people. For spiritual living, you can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in Christian life is that you've chose to walk in the power of the old sin nature, the flesh, to gratify some kind of need that you think is important to your life that the Bible calls sin. It could be mental attitude types of sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. How do we get out of carnality and back to the indwelling spiritual ministry of the Holy Spirit? I confess my sin. Takes me back to the cross and cleansing. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. Takes me back to the cross of where the Christian life began. Christ died there for all sin. Why haven't you died to sin in your life? Right? The question is, why haven't you died to sin in your life? If you've been crucified, and you have, if you've been crucified with Christ, it is not you that live, 
but nevertheless, it is Christ who lives in you. And the life that you live now, you live by faith. Not by sight, and not by, not by your own desires to fulfill things that God says are not proper for the Christian life. So I'm going to give you a moment through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9 to confess sin if necessary. And to pray that God would teach you great things today about the mystery of the rapture. Why, why it is part of the mystery doctrine. And the day of the Lord is not. It's not a mystery. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister as he has been um, commissioned by, by you, Father, uh, to teach and recall us out of John 15, the truth of the Word of God. Pray, Father, that this would be true in our lives today as we approach the mystery, how, how the rapture is a mystery and the day of the Lord is not in regard to the second coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in my introduction, I, I, the first coming of Christ was not a mystery. I mean, the great prophets of the Old Testament prophesied that there would come a prophet like Elijah who would herald and introduce Israel to their Messiah. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially Matthew and John, record great details about the first coming of Christ. We know that. We, we teach the virgin birth out of Isaiah 7, 14, that Christ would come, the Messiah would come through uh, the channel. And, and we know the genealogy of Matthew 1 and Luke 3. We're familiar with all of that, that the Messiah was to come through the seed of the woman of Genesis 3.15. I mean, we know that. John came, and I love, I love John, the gospel of John's descriptive description of the coming of Christ that fulfilled prophecy. The second coming of Christ out of the Old Testament will fulfill prophecy. When you get to eschatology, the church really bogs down because you have to study Old Testament books like Ezekiel, Zechariah, uh, Daniel. And it requires he Hebrew, and it requires some study. And, and, and we're used to studying mystery doctrines and, and not prophetic doctrines. And so you have to kind of switch yourself in and out. When I, do, when I do prophecy on the coming of Christ, whether it be first or second, I have to leave. I have to go to the Old Testament and put myself in the shoes of the Old Testament prophets and re regroup myself in Hebrew to really understand what the prophets were saying. I have, as a good teacher, in my opinion, that's just my opinion, as a good teacher, I've got to go back to the original language. I've got to spend time with that prophet walking in his shoes. Now, it's probably because I'm a slow learner, but I have to do that. I have to kind of live. If I'm speaking for Daniel, I have to kind of live with Daniel a little while in order to get the feel of it. And I believe, at least in my life, the Holy Spirit honors that and does that with me. But I have difficulty jumping back and forth and all of that. So I'd rather go in and do a study if I'm going to study the tribulation I'd rather go look at Daniel and study Daniel and spend time with him and let the Holy Spirit kind of set me back into that century uh, uh, of thinking. Uh, that's just the way I do things, and it's, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody else. But when John comes preaching that he's been sent by God as a prophet to introduce Israel to their Messiah... He quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3. I recorded this on your paper in John 1, 23. He, John the Baptist, said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make stray the way, with the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. And so, so there, was, there was no confusion about the first coming of Christ in the Old Testament. There's no confusion about what we call the second coming. 
In the Old Testament, they just called it the coming of the Messiah. And so there was no first and second coming identity. There was just the coming of the Lord. You had to pay attention to all of that. Well, in the New Testament, it's easier for me, a, a Gentile, a Gentile from Michigan, <laughs> which puts a little difficulty with it, to be able, it makes it easier for me, okay, I can, I can separate all the teaching prophecies on the first coming of Christ from the prophecies of the second coming of Christ. Boy, that's a big help. And when I do studies on them, I can, I can isolate myself and go in there and look at that. I'm, I'm thankful for the teachings of the Apostle Paul for that. And the other, other writers that did it as well in the New Testament. So we're going to look at this idea today. Uh, because there's a difference between the rapture of the church and the day of the Lord, technically, when you're dealing with the second coming of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51, it's not on your paper, but you should write it down and then later look at it. Uh, Paul said, and remember, remember 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 are the two great passages on the rapture. And Paul introduces in verse 50, now I'm in verse 51 to go through 58. He introduces, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And then he goes on in twinkling of an eye and goes into a discussion on it. And he used the word musterion and applied it to the second coming of Christ. He applied it, he applied it to eschatology, which is an interesting word. It's a New Testament word. It's a whole doctrinal concept of the New Testament. We, we drag that idea into the Old Testament. We study eschatology because we understand the mystery of the church, and we drag that over to the Old Testament prophecies dealing with the second coming of Christ. Well, they never called it that. They called it the coming of Christ. It's just interesting to a guy like me. It may not be you, but it is. it's interesting to a, a, a student of the word like I am. Listen, I'm, I'm not a teacher, I'm a student. I have the gift, but I'm a student in the Word. I have the gift to teach her, but I'm a student in the Word. I hope I never lose that desire to be a student in the Word of God. I'm always learning. I'm, I, I find it interesting. I guess that'll be the way my entire life because I have not found a place where I'm ever comfortable. Like, well, I have that now. Um, I'm never comfortable with that because... One door opens another door, and it opens another door, and it just goes on and on because of the character of God, in my opinion. I mean, how can you know all knowledge when you don't know all that knowledge has told you? Right? I mean, is that God all-knowing? Well, I, I want to get as much of that. I want to tap into that. But listen, at my best, who would know how, what percentage I would have of that? Even what's been revealed let alone what's not been revealed. Think how much God has not revealed to us because we don't have enough doctrine. When we get to heaven, he's going to reveal to us stuff that we couldn't have possibly imagined. And when we get there, it's going to be as simple as inventing a toothpick. God, well, how come I couldn't have thought of that? No. Well, anyhow, that's just the way I think about it. So let me talk about five things this morning on Father's Day. Okay. <laughs> This is our typical Father's Day message, not, not everybody else's. God's great dispensational mystery was the formation, watch this now, was the formation of the body of Christ as spiritually gifted ministries. Is that not amazing? When we talk about the mystery of the church, we're talking about the mystery of the body of Christ on earth by spiritually gifted ministries. Boy, I'll tell you, when I was a young pastor and I learned that, and I didn't learn it in seminary, when I learned that, it broke my world wide open. 
I had never heard that in my life. I paid a lot of money to hear it, never heard it. Never heard it. God's great dispensational ministry, the church, was the formation of the body of Christ by spiritually gifted ministries, which Paul talks about in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. The church upon the earth became the great mystery of the church age beginning at Pentecost, Acts 2. And with the advent of the Holy Spirit, John 16, 7 through 11, when he comes, he will convict the world. Do we not live off that? I, listen, my job is not to convict the world. My, jo my job is to preach the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit convict him of sin, judgment, and righteousness. If I do my job, he'll do his, will he not? I mean, he's God the Holy Spirit, I would hope so. I would hope so. The rapture is a mystery doctrine, while the day of the Lord is used with old covenant prophecy of the second coming of Christ. The day of the Lord is not a mystery in the old covenant. In Romans, the 16th chapter, verses 25 through 27, I wrote on your paper. This is a New American Standard Version. Now to him who is able to establish you, watch the word according. He's going to say it three times. By that, you ought to be able to play it. Right? If you have an accordion, you ought to be able to play it. After three lessons, at least twinkle, twinkle, little star. If anybody has ever ever went, tried to learn any music, that's the first that's the first one they teach you, right? I took guitar, they taught me. Trumpet, that's what they taught me. Maybe it was just the teacher I had in the age in which I was. Well, anyhow, apparently you're not ready for any accordions. Now, to him who was able to establish, what's that word now? To establish you according to one according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. That's first advent. Two, according to the revelation of the mystery. Woo, church age. Which has been secret for long ages past. Well, you know, you're in Romans, so you have to, long age past put, takes you to old covenant. But now... Church age, but now mystery, church age, is manifested and by scriptures of the prophets, according, third, according to the commandment of eternal God, has been known to all nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever. Amen. In other words, the same scripture that has established the foundation of the first coming of Christ will establish the second coming of Christ. What sets in between them is the mystery of the church. You and I live in the mystery. Isn't that interesting? And the job of the Holy Spirit is to teach us everything he, he can about the mystery because that's the period of human history that you and I live in every day as expected us to walk by faith in. Listen, the pastors of the church today, have an, of, of the church age, have an enormous responsibility to teach clearly the mystery doctrines which are covered, to teach clearly. That's why guys are passionate about that. Listen, I, we, in the School of Biblical Theology, we never have any problem. The guys want to learn the Greek language to study the New Testament. I mean, lights out. Take them to the Old Testament Hebrew. I mean, I have to bring a crowbar in to get it in them. And, and listen, I understand that. And, and I mean, I, when I went through school, I had so many of my friends couldn't wait to get through Greek. And when they did, I say, they said, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> and they never taught it again. I mean, they closed th they, two years of Greek and they were done. Uh, so, 
you know, for me, I didn't have an option on it because I found out that whole New Testament, all the mystery doctrines were in Greek. So, for me, it wasn't. So, there's, he put Paul in Romans 16, and then you should at some point read Ephesians, the third chapter, and the first 11 verses about the mystery being revealed. Uh, the book of Ephesians is wonderful on that subject matter, by the way. Point number two. Rapture, harpazo, in the Greek, you know, when we say, when we call it rapture, that's a transliteration from the Greek to Latin. That's Latin theology, like Calvary. We call it Golgotha. And we call it Calvary in Latin. So it's the influence of theology upon us. Rapture is the first in a series of the parousia events of the second coming of Christ. Look, look at in 1 Thessalonians, if, if, you're, if you still have your Bibles open, 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. He says, For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. You are all sons of light and of day. Now, he's talking about light and day, night and darkness. All right? Here's what I want you to understand, that when you study this passage, I want you to remember that every church-age believer is a son of light and day because of their position in Jesus Christ. Okay, that's positional truth, or what's called in theology, positional sanctification. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. How do you get in Christ? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. You believe the gospel, he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into union with Christ. So that everything he is, you become in your dispensation. He's a son, you're a son. He's a priest, you're a priest. You're a priest after the order of Jesus Christ, who was after the order of Melchizedek, separate from Leviticus, the Levitical priesthood. And so the list goes on. He's an heir, I'm an heir, inheritance, an inheritance, eternal life, eternal life, etc. Kind of important to know that. Now, look on your paper. So Paul introduces rapture is part of the mystery of the church. I just, I just told you that in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I tell you a mystery. And he talks about the rapture being caught up. We'll all be changed. Okay. So we have the rapture. All church age believers caught up in the sky. Christ comes back, not to the earth, to the atmosphere of the earth. See on your paper? So we call that rapture. What is the next in line in the parousia is the tribulation. The last seven years, the last seven years of the Jewish age. The Jewish age was interrupted by the mystery of the church. That's Daniel 9, 20, 24 through 27. Somewhere like that. Daniel 9. So you need to know that that we still have seven years of the tribulation. You know what happened? The church interrupted the fifth cycle of divine discipline upon Israel. The coming of Christ interrupted it. And there's still seven years more of it. You know... Human history without biblical history is confusing. I'll give you an example. We live in the generational period of the mystery of the church, of the Holocaust. And everybody goes, Holocaust. Oh my goodness, the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. It was instituted by Germany. Okay? As bad as that was, it pales in comparison to three prior events in the life of the Jewish people. 
Assyrian, fifth cycle of discipline. Babylon, fifth cycle of discipline. Rome, fifth cycle of discipline. You want to really know how bad things can get? You need to read the five cycles of divine discipline out of the Old Testament. Read the fifth cycle. It'll keep you up at night. If that thing was made into a movie, you wouldn't be able to watch it. And there's no, there is no station in the whole wide world that, that would put it on because it's worse than R or X-rated as far as violence. Listen to me. As bad as the Holocaust was, it pales in comparison to what the Jewish people went through prior to it. And listen, when we talk about the tribulation, we're talking about the Lord interrupted the fifth cycle on their life and is coming back. It's called the tribulation. And the tribulation will bring the day of the Lord. He'll return again. And... Take care of it, like he always did. He did it with Assyria. He did it with Babylon. He did it with Rome. He'll do it with that. The day of the Lord, a new day, the day of the Lord. But listen, before it becomes a new day, it's going to become a terrible day, a day of destruction as the world has never known. You need to get these Jewish people saved. Don't, listen, don't be intimidated that they know Hebrew. Listen, holding the Bible in your hand could send you just as quick to hell as to heaven. Depends on what you do with it. I mean, you've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the third day, third day called the gospel in order to be saved. Only the saved get to heaven. Well, so we have the rapture. The rapture, as soon as the church is removed, then we're going to have the tribulation. Just in general. At the end of that, it's called the war of Armageddon. It's going to be the day of the Lord. That's going to issue in the millennium. At the end of the millennium, there's going to be another day of the Lord. It's called Gog and Magog. And listen, any place in biblical history, you can look back and you can see that God put the fifth cycle on people and it was a terrible thing and it was followed by the day of the Lord and a new hope. My, 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 my. If you don't learn anything else, learn that. Did, what, what happened to the Jews after Assyria just whacked them unmercifully? God raised up another group. What happened after Babylon? And listen, Babylon was terrible. Let's them on. You know what's interesting to me? Some of these people were known to be cruel people, but listen, the Jewish people under the fifth did more cruel things to themselves than the other people did to them. You ought to read the fifth cycle of divine discipline. Go, go on the website. Go on the website. And, and look up our teachings on that. Terrible. I mean, they're ter it's terrible what they did. Well, the day of the Lord, when he comes back, remember rapture, he comes only in the air, but when he comes back, the day of the Lord, when he comes back, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 and Acts 1, it says, as you see him go, where did he go from? You're going to see him come back. Acts 1, 9 through 11, it tells you there. Then, of course, you have the millennial reign. And then this is, I'm just showing you highlights of it. That would be important to Jew and Gentile. Here's 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 2 through 4. For you yourselves know, that's the word oida, Listen, I can teach 
40, 50 people in any given meeting or more, which you only learn individually. You don't learn collectively, if you learn individually. You come collectively, you assemble yourselves together as the manner of some, and don't forsake that. That's where you're fed. But listen, you eat individually. That's the word, you yourselves. No. You yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, there's no definite article with the word the, which is important, will come like a thief in the night. And while they, those in the night, say peace and safety, destruction. That's divine raft. Destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child. And they will not escape. But you, brethren, church age believers, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. He gave two metaphors. Don't miss them now that are inescapable. 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 And what he's talking about is that when the day of the Lord comes, it will come suddenly. People will be unaware. They're taking life just common. They're not expecting somebody to rob them. They're not thinking that somebody... I grew up in a culture like that. Nobody locked their doors. When I went home on uh, a few days of R&R to Michigan, nobody locked their doors. I, w I, wasn't in the major I wasn't in Detroit. I was in farm community. I was in the farm community I grew up with. Everybody, that's the way everybody still lives. They don't lock anything. It's kind of like if, they, if somebody needs it's a neighbor, he'll get it and bring it back. <laughs> Guess we'll all do that down here in Birmingham. <clears throat> Not likely. <clears throat> well, yeah, two metaphors that are inescapable. Right? Two metaphors, inescapable. <clears throat> but we are not of that. We are not those children. The church age. Point three. In our lesson text, Paul distinguished between the rapture and the day of the Lord. He says, now as to the times and epochs. Notice I wrote them out in the Greek. That, that C-H-R-O, that should be an, not an M, but an N. That's where you get chronology. That's where you get chronology, the study, right, of, of events as they're laid out. There is a conjunctive conjunction, an adjunctive conjunction, ain't that something? In the Greek language, with the word chi, the word and, which means that the first is connected to the second, they're inseparable. They're just giving two different looks at something. The chronology and the epic, which is kairos. In other words, they're... they're, they're, they're He's looking at the whole thing of eschatology, looking at the whole event of the second coming of Christ, looking at parousia, of which it begins with the rapture, and now we're into events. Brethren, you have no need, and then he went on to discuss that. Uh, I think what might be important to you, and I wrote it down, see the word that, at, under point three, if I put full well, look, he said, for you yourself know, oida, perfect tense, full well, that, that, they just said the word full, but it means full well. It's an adverb. I don't know, it should be a, 
the full well, that, that's hoita, that's a, that's a, a declarative conjunction. Everything I've said now, here's where, here's where it comes down to. That the, the day of the Lord, I don't know, it's just printed wrong. The day of the Lord will come. I hope John cleaned that up. Did John clean all that up on your paper? <clears throat> just like a thief in the night. All right. The disciples of Jesus were confused over the distinction between the time gap between the first and second coming. I talked about it in Acts 1, 6 through 12 at the ascension. Matthew 24, 36 through 37. But of that day and hour no man knows. Now he's, he's speaking to Jewish believers. Not even the angels of heaven were in Matthew, nor the Son. No one knows the day or the hour. No one knows. Not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. And we've been studying that. And what Paul is saying, that it will come suddenly. And people will be unaware. Now, you say, well, how they could, look, the, the guy spent 120 years and built an ark and preached every day. Yeah, but they didn't know the day or the hour the rain was going to come and destroy them. That's the point. Matthew 24, 39. They, talking about the disciples of Jesus, they did not understand until the flood came. Well, he's talking about... Um, they talk about Noah's people. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. That's what he's trying to explain to his disciples. What they don't understand at this point, Matthew 24, is the mystery of the church that's between this. They don't understand that. They think that the first coming and the second coming is one deal that there's no first second they don't understand that and so he's patient with them like we all should be see and he's talking about listen in the old testament the flood of noah in the new testament the rapture look look or, or the day of the lord here's what he's saying you know the event that's coming. You know the event. But what you don't know is the day or the hour. The rapture's coming, but you don't know the uh, uh, The day of the Lord is coming, but you don't know the day or the hour. Noah preached, the, the divine judgment is coming. The ark is ready. Get a pass. How do I get a pass to get aboard? You got to believe that Jesus came, died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead third day. Galatians 3.8. That's how people got saved in the Old Testament. A prophetic gospel. But if you're saved, you're safe. If you're an unbeliever, then you're under judgment. That's how simple that was. It wasn't complicated. The ark, the ark is where your safety is. And the only way on the ark, the only way on the ark is through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and life of no man. So there we have it. The day of the Lord, as a technical term, was an old covenant scriptural term for what we now call the second coming of Christ. This led to confusion about Elijah with John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. In Matthew, I'll just take a look at Matthew with you a little bit. I, there are other scriptures for you to read. Uh, but in 11, I wrote down 11, 14. They were wanting to know
you know, who are you? In verse 3, they said to him, are you the expected one or shall we be looking for someone else? So in 14, he says, if you are willing, in, in verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Now, see, they're familiar with that because the last book of the Old Covenant, Malachi, talked about this very issue with uh, the coming of a prophet after the order of, uh, or the likeness of Elijah. And they now know that that is John. I, I, is it John or Jesus or who, who is this? And so J Jesus has, has clarified that. Uh, Luke, the first chapter, 16 through 27, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Isaiah 11, 4, all of these are references, what they're not understanding, and that, that's okay. Look, man, if, if I'd have lived in that period, I'd been asking these questions. These are not, I mean, you know, J John said, listen, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's Isaiah, that, that's a prophecy out of Isaiah 40. Um, I mean, John knew who he was. And he knew he had come to baptize in water of Jordan the Messiah. And he wouldn't know it until the Holy Spirit would come and, and like a dove, land on him and reveal to John who the Messiah was. So John come baptizing male Jewish guys that, you know, were uh, of faith that Christ was coming of the faith that Christ was coming. Their Savior was coming. Their Redeemer was coming. And he started baptizing them. And John, the first chapter, talks about that. One day he baptized Jesus, and, and there it was. There was the Messiah, and, and he pointed to everybody, here's your Messiah. Uh, and he gave testimony to that. And the disciples that were following him some of them left John, not all of them, but some of them left John when he said, follow him. They left him and followed Jesus. Jesus turned around and said, who are you following? And then you have the whole story of, of Jesus selecting disciples for the church. It's just, a, just, you know, you have to read this stuff. And so in Matthew 27, 40, uh, in 27, 47, about the ninth hour, this is Christ on the cross. He cried out with a loud voice and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sapdaniah, which means, interpreted, means, why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, that's Eli, Eli, why have you forsaken me? All right? Some of those who were standing there when they heard it, began saying, this man's calling for Elijah. What, the, the, what, Eli is my, the word L, L in Greek, L is God, and the I is my. My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? He was quoting Psalms 22.1. These people... are thinking because their mind is about John the Baptist and Elijah and Elijah coming. And listen, Elijah will be part of the second coming of Christ. They didn't understand the difference of, of the role of Elijah in the first coming and Elijah in the second coming. Listen, Elijah will actually be part of the second. I'm talking about Elijah the prophet will actually be part of the second coming of Christ. You know the two witnesses in, in Revelation? Elijah and Moses. How do you know that? Because of the transfiguration. In Matthew 17. If you read Matthew 17, you read the transfiguration. Jesus meeting with Moses and Elijah. These are the two prophets that are going to meet again. 
they're, they're all confused about it because they, and, and right, probably rightly so about it, because they can't, they're trying to connect the first coming and the second coming as one event. And actually, it's more than one event. You're going to have the rapture of the church. You're going to have the tribulation. Then you're going to have the millennium. You know, in between, the, the, you're going to have the second coming of Christ. They, they don't understand that because the mystery of the church. And listen, if you, try, if you don't get clarity of the mystery of the church between the first coming and the second coming out of the Old Testament, you will get all your scriptures, all your scriptures will get so confusing by not doing that, just like the disciples were. So it's really important that you, you, you do that. It was believed that Elijah would be one of the two witnesses of the second coming of Christ, Matthew 17. You can, you can read about this two witnesses in Revelation, the 11th chapter, and a discussion of it in Malachi, the 4th chapter. Point number 5. In 1 Thessalonians, our passage, 5, 1 through 5, a description of the day of the Lord is given by two metaphors. Destruction by a thief... And pain by childbirth. Destruction and pain. When you look at those two metaphors, do you see that? You know, a thief comes to steal and destroy. And that business. And pain. Destruction and pain are connected. And who are the they? Well, those are, those are the people... They, they, they are the unbelievers who are saying safe, uh, peace and safety. Everything is good as it was. Listen, as it was in the days of Noah, it would be in the days of the Son of Man. One of the issues was they didn't understand the divine judgment of God. And he didn't give them a day or an hour when it would be. One day he showed up and he said to Noah, enter the ark now. And we are in the hour in the day when he does that. And so when you have those illustrations, you go with that. In verses 4 and 5, I'm going to go turn over to my passage. But you brethren, church age believers, that's who he's writing to, the Thessalonians, but you brethren are not in darkness, You are not in darkness. You are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of night or of darkness. That's why the rapture will come before the tribulation. We're not going to go halfway through the tribulation. We're not going to go a quarter of the way, the half of the day. We're not going to go one moment through the tribulation as church-age believers. Christ is going to come back for the church. He's not coming back for other people. He's coming back for the church. Part of the church will be with him, those who have died prior in the church age. And those of us who will remain and alive in the church age will be caught up together in the sky. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, what's that going to be like, Ron? It's going to be <laughs> lights out. I mean, I don't know. I'll be up there where fireworks are going off. That's where I'll be. I mean, I don't know any other way to tell you. I'll be up there where the Birds fly and airplanes go, and what do I know? I just know that we'll be caught up together with them in the cloud or the sky. What that will, I don't know, but we'll change from life to life without going through death. Think about that.
listen to me now. Listen to me. Look up here. Let, let me tell you why that's important. Because you're gonna, one day you're going to die with, before the rapture. That's the po probability. I don't know because I don't know the hour of the day. When you die, you're going to go from life to life. Death is not going to be any more big deal there than it is at the rapture. You're going to be changed. You're going to go from time to time, eternal time. You're going to go from human time to eternal time because you have eternal life in you. You're going to go from life to life. You're not, death is nothing. You're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. The difference between these two events is that when you die prior to the rapture, you don't have a body. You're in a sleep, your body is in a sleep state. A sleep state. It's called a sleep. When the rapture comes, you'll go through it and you'll get your body immediately. It's the only difference. The last thing in this world you should ever fear is death. The last thing you should ever fear is death. All death is is to change from time to eternity. It's the only thing. It don't matter, no matter how it looks, how they're dying, you go like, well, I, I wouldn't want to die that way. Listen, you wouldn't want to die anyway other than in Christ. But a lot of times we look at the way people die and don't realize that if they're a believer, the way they died has nothing to do with their death as far as exiting. Listen, in a twinkling of an eye, you leave your body to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present in a, in a twinkling of an eye. My wife, when she was in the hospital before we brought her home, for her last days. I can't tell you how many times she acknowledged that her mother was at the door and it was time to go. All the nurses, at first I thought that, all the nurses thought she was talking about going home. But if you stayed in the room with her long enough and she said it enough, you knew what she was talking about. She was talking about going home. And she kept saying to her mother, I'm ready. She had a conversation with her at the door. I am ready. Mama, I am ready. I'm ready to go home. And uh, let me tell you, when it comes, it's, you go from one position to another position, whatever you're thinking death is, it is not. That was, listen to me now, all the agony of defeat of death was done at the cross for you and me. The death that he died once for all is what you, you, he took your death so you could have his life. And when the day comes for the knock at your door, it'll be nothing. It'll be the most joyful event. You will move from life to life. I can't tell you over the 50 some years I've been in ministry how many people I have sat with who died who had my wife's experience who had real conversations with people who came 
to be with them on their journey. In their, in their acknowledgement. Now, I didn't see anybody. I just sat there and listened to conversations between people who were believers having conversations with people just like they were having with me. It's just, you have no idea how powerful salvation is for your life. Not just to get from one day to the other, but when the, in the big scheme of things. And I tell you, people that know that, there comes a point when they say their goodbyes and they are ready. <laughs> they say their goodbyes and they are ready. I pray that over your life and mine. I pray that for everybody. It's appointed under men who wants to die. And you don't want the second part of that in judgment. But it's appointed to us to die. We're going to die apart from the rapture. The rapture is the most spectacular thing you could probably imagine. Can you imagine that? I mean, it, I, when Paul did it, he said, I, I, I don't know if I actually did it. I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. I can't really explain it because I don't know. But this I know, I wound up in heaven. I wound up in the third heaven. But I, I, the event, the event, the, the, the dying part was nothing. <laughs> Happiest Father's Day. <laughs> well, <laughs> Happy Father's Day. My, my, my. Right. What's interesting, he sets it up in verse 2 and 3, and then in verse 4 and 5. He uses the word but, and it's used as a contrast or what we call an adversative conjunction. But you, in contrast to though unbeliever, you as church age believers, brethren, are not in the darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. You are sons of light. The day of the Lord of the second coming will be a time of severe divine judgment upon the unbelieving world like the day of Noah's flood. The tribulation will conclude with six bowls of the wrath of God and it will end with the war of Armageddon that when the Bible described it, described it in military terms of the Calvary and said the blood would flow to the tops of the bridles of, horse, of military horses, the big ones that fought in the wars. My, my, my. So Jesus reminds me, I am coming like a thief. I am coming like a thief. For you, brethren, not in darkness, you are in the day that the day would overtake you. Now, take a, take a, take a piece of paper out, or write on the back of your paper, or somewhere in your paper. I want, to, I, want you to, I want to jot this down for you later, between now and next Father's Day. <laughs> I want to give you something, and then we're going to go home. I'm in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians could well be called the greatest book about the Father, God. It is in this book that he says that there is one God and the Father of us all. This is the book. Write these down. This is the, every chapter has a doctrinal point uh, about God the Father. It is one of the great Father Day books of all time. So write this down. Write down 117. You should read from about 15 to 19. The second chapter, verse 18, you should read about 18 through 22. Chapter 3, verse 14, you should read about 14 through 19. Verse 6 is where I got the idea, was the fourth chapter, verse 6. You should read verses about 4 through 6. Fifth chapter, verse 20, you should read from about 15 through 21. And the sixth chapter, 23, 
it closed, Paul closes out his book in verses 23 and 24. He writes, Peace be to the, to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father. It's a great book. It's a Father's Day book for reading. You should read that. 117, 218, 314, 46, 520, 623. It is a great read for Father's Day. It is the Father's Day book of books. Well, let's cl close in a word of prayer. Rick will take us out with a pledge. And happy Father's Day to all of those who have fathers. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of us have a father. Our Heavenly Father who cares and nurtures us more than, cares about us probably more than any human father could ever do. Those that have fathers like that, that care about him more than life itself, are privileged. Who have had the joy to grow up with an honorable person in their life. A man of God. I thank you for my grandfather that played that role in my life. My grandfather Holman. Be with our fathers. Father, if there was ever a time in our nation when we need fathers that understand biblical fatherhood, it is now. We need to have them step up to the plate and be men of God. The church of Jesus Christ needs to always lead the way always lead the way to be honorable men. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.